welcome to the Brock Interview Series with host Thomas S. Orwatt Jr. Welcome to episode number 77 of the Rock Interview Series. I'm Thomas Orwatt Jr. It is June 15th, 2023. And for this feature, I have Juan Cruchier, bass player, songwriter of the legendary 80s hard rock band Rat, as my special guest. During this interview, Juan and I discuss Rat's recently released box set, The Atlantic Years, 1984 to 1991, which consists of the band's first five studio records and many extra collectibles. All records feature Rat's classic lineup of Stephen Piercy on vocals, Warren D. Martini on guitars, Robin Crosby on guitars, Juan Cruchier on bass and vocals, and Bobby Blotzer on drums. This box set is available on vinyl and CD. So let's get started. Here he is, Juan Cruchier. Before we get started, please subscribe to the Rock Interview Series. Hey everyone, welcome to the Rock Interview Series. And look who we have today. We have Juan from Rat with us. And we are going to be just... And we are going to be discussing uh, what Juan's been up to uh, recently, and we're also going to discuss this epic masterpiece collection that was just recently released. Juan, do you have one of these? I'm, I'm assuming you probably have several, right? I, I do. I have one, and I was very impressed when I got it, and I took a look at it. It is amazing. I mean, this thing has some weight to it. I mean, this is the ultimate collection of rat. For any rap fans, you must have this. Any fans of music, good music, this is this is amazing. This is probably one of the best box sets I've ever seen in like collecting in like you know forty years. This has it all: guitar picks, special tour book edition, uh, on the road, behind the scenes, a guitar pick. So we're gonna get into this, but I just want to catch up and and see what you've been doing um recently. Um, the last time rap played out, yeah, you played out with rap was in uh. August of 2021, which um, I think your last gig you played was uh, kind of close to where I am. I'm in Buffalo, New York. Um, I believe you played in Syracuse, New York at the at the State Fair. Is that correct? Was that the last show that rap? That's correct. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, did it, at the time did you realize? Did you know that that was going to be the last rat show for a while? Um, the the rat issue is something that I really don't want to address at this point. Okay. Um. Um, I will say this though, um, the box set, um, was remastered and Andy Pierce mastered it, remastered it. And it sounds really, really good. Um, I'm looking forward to putting it on a turntable and I've got a digital turntable that, you know, actually goes to a USB output. Yeah. And I'm looking forward to hearing the remastering off of the vinyl, which I think will be really interesting because, it sounds to me, I listened to the the uh, the mastering sort of samples, and Andy brought out more of the upper mids where the guitars sit. So now the guitars are a little more up front. And so you you put that along with the, the low end that, that vinyl gives you, and you're probably going to have a very interesting sounding set of records. So if folks pick up this box set, they can look forward to hearing – uh, the audio it, it definitely enhanced from mm -hmm. the regular regular you know the regular vinyl that we released back in the day yeah 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 one, one of the things with uh with vinyl uh, reissues is a lot of times the vinyl is just a transfer of the uh, digital recording and you don't really get that analog um the warmness i guess of analog um so is this is, is this different in that case yeah, you know, it, it's, you know, he, he basically um, sort of, you know, um, changed the frequency responses and, you know, mixes are really delicate. Uh, you know, if you turn up the low end, you lose some, some of the upper high end because it changes the energy, right? So it's a very delicate balance. And a, a lot of times when songs are mixed, you know, you try to be as objective as you can, but there's a lot of factors that go into it, like the speakers that you're listening to and the, the, the room that you're, you know, mixing in. And so um, when you master something, obviously you have that final sort of objective, um, you know, critical listen. And 
it's all subjective. So by remastering it, um, and he did, you know, change the frequencies. Um, you you hear things that you didn't hear before. Wow. Yeah. You know, all of a sudden you're going, wow, I never that lick back there because it's more pronounced. So it, it's sort of a refreshing, uh, you know, look at it um, if you compare it to the original mastering. So, um, yeah, you know, I, I think people will really enjoy it. I, I noticed the difference. Wow. That, that's, that's something yeah. else. Yeah. Um, so were, were you were you like personally involved in this project at all? Or No, we, we actually worked on it for quite a long time. And I actually uh, all of us went um and basically went through our pictures and you know old scrapbooks and things that we had from the past and kind of to sort of like i had for example i had old ticket stubs you know so uh people from the group contributed and um and it was a process so it wasn't thrown together and we all um you know the the surviving members uh of this era um contributed pictures and uh, had ideas to for things to include, you know. So it was a collaborative effort and uh, it was uh, an enjoyable process. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, when when did the process start and how long did it take to put this all together before you finally get, had it in your hands? Oh, we've been working on this thing for well over a year, uh, maybe a year and a half. Um, I'd have to go back and look at all the emails because it's been, you know, it's been, <laughs> it's been a lot of... Uh, uh, you know, with the, um, I think the, uh, maybe the coronavirus um, sort of, you know, a lot of people had plans and then things happened and it slowed everything down. And, but we, it's been about a year and a half, I believe. Um, and, um, you know, it, it was um, uh, sort of a step-by-step -step process. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it was really nice to have everyone involved. Uh, and and giving their input and uh, so on the in the tour booklet there are pictures that have never been seen before from our personal archives and that was kind of neat and uh, I went through a lot of my uh, pictures that I had boxed up and um, you know looked at things that I hadn't seen in years you know in an effort to to make this you know unique and and special for the fans out there uh, but it was a, a long process I'd say a year and a half. Uh, maybe at this point, closer to two years. Wow. Yeah. 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 I mean, it, it definitely looks like there's a lot of work done on it. I mean, it's pretty incredible. Yeah. And there was, there was a time, though, to, just to be clear that, um, you know, because of, um, you know, the scheduling and, and you know, we're dealing with a, a, a big company, um, that things were sort of, you know, on hold to figure out what their scheduling was, um, what releases they were going to do, and, you know, where we fit into that. So it wasn't two years of constant work. It was, you know, um, it was done in chunks, sort of, in, in bits and pieces, you know. Yeah. Now, now you, you said that you were impressed with the way um, that, that it sounds. What, what record do you think was the most impressive as far as an improvement in sound goes? Well, you know, as we recorded over the years, you know, the technology changed and so um, and different engineers and producers have different techniques, you know, um, you know, so naturally towards the end when, um, you know, there was a, a sort of a change in, in the technology, those records reflected that sound, that that sonic change. Um, but I think, um, you know, the detonator record uh, had a very crisp and punchy sound to it. Um, but you know, when you go back to something like out of the cellar or invasion of your privacy, you know, there's a magic there. Um, and it's hard to, to put your finger on it, but once you capture a certain point in time, it's unique to that point in time. Right. Right. So, yeah. you know, um, a lot of times it's hard to say one's better than the other, you know, but, um, we definitely, um, tried to improve our sonic footprint as we moved along and we would, of course, we would, like any other artist or group, we'd listen back to our records and, and kind of think about what we could do to improve them, you know? Um, 
And so it was um, an interesting process in, in the sense that, you know, when we did out of the cellar, we didn't have a whole lot of equipment. And then when we came back after having toured for whatever it was, over a year solid, um, maybe more, we actually had a little bit of money to buy better equipment, you know? <laughs> so that alone was a big improvement, you know? I remember walking in and all of a sudden I'm, I'm, I'm seeing this, this wall of Marshall heads, not amps, not cabinets, heads. <laughs> it was like, there must have been 20 or 30 heads stacked up and they were you know warren and robin were going through them and seeing which heads were sounding good at the time you know because they change as they sit there you know so we were able to improve records incrementally as we were going along for a lot of factors but we were always looking back and and going okay how can we make this next record you know just you know as good as our peers or as best as we can make it, you know, everyone's listening to everybody else. And, you know, for example, you know, um, I can't think of anybody that wasn't listening to Def Leppard and Mutt Lang, you know, and the, what they were doing, you know, it was very, very significant. So, you know, and that's just an example, but um, so we tried to really sort of, um, you know, um, sort of evolve, went through and we're doing these records yeah i, I definitely uh i feel that day you had um but that that out of the cellar record i mean that is such a classic release um i mean those songs really stand the test of time i was at the gym earlier today and i heard round and round i mean it's just like you hear those songs that like you know the weirdest places that you wouldn't expect to hear them and it's uh, like i said it's it's held up and and held up to the test of time and i i think that record was brilliant yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You know, we were using, um, you know, analog equipment, you know, uh, Studer tape machines, um, Neve consoles, um, and they have a certain sound, you know, just like, uh, you know, uh, even like the 60s sort of had a sound, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, records from that, that era. And it was just so you know, uh, a lot of tubes were being used back in the 60s. Um, and the technology was such that, um, you know, you would get a unit that's really good and it was kind of magical because it was difficult to replicate it, you know. So uh, when we were doing the, like, for example, out of the cellar, we would, you know, we were obviously analog based and we really were going for a certain sound. Um, and the Neve console with the Studer machine just had a real nice, warm musical sound, you know, and um, we know we captured that. Yeah. Were you, were you uh, surprised at how that record took off and what it became like in that time period? I mean, it took you guys from a bar band to like, you know, almost the point where you could headline arenas. You know, I mean, I was surprised that we, you know, we were able to, you know, to, to get to where we got to before we made the record, you know, I mean, surprise is, is, you know, I, I was hoping is what it was. I was hoping, you know, there were a lot of uh, tears to sort of, you know, transcend, if you will. Um, making a great record was fundamental. Uh, at the time that we made uh, out of the cellar, you know, MTV was just starting. So, we we did this thing. We did a, a music video of, of which there were very few at the time, and um, we we were able to to place our video. I remember Don Letts, I believe his name was, was the producer of the the uh, round and round video, and you know we just shot it in a day. Um, came up with uh, sort of a loose storyboard of how we sort of wanted it to go, and. Um, then we delivered it to MTV, and that really, really helped um, familiarize people with the band because a lot of people were just trying to get cable TV, and MTV was like, you know, they only had like maybe 50 videos. So it was, a lot of it was timing along with putting out a solid record and being consistent. And there's one thing that, you know, that Rat took a lot of pride in, and that was being a really good live band. Yeah. You know, we, we, if, if you look at things, you know, look, the, 
the total opposite would have been a, a group like Steely Dan, right? You know, Steely Dan was in, in one of the greatest groups in the world, um, but they were studio guys that got together and made excellent recordings, I mean, amazing songs and records, and then they went out and played live. Rat was a live band that went into the studio to capture that, that aggressiveness and that power and energy and try to sort of harness that onto a record so we could continue to play live, mm -hmm. you know? So there was a series of things that um, I was hopeful that we would be able to achieve and then replicate because it was all about, you know, we never felt comfortable. It was always like we wanted to, um, you know, sort of outshine ourselves in the sense that um, that was good. Now, now let's, let's get, let's go to the next level, you know? So, um, you know, it, it, it was a, a, a little bit of a gamble. It's a dangerous uh, career. <laughs> yeah. You know, really kicked ass for those six years. Now in 1984, you went out on the road with Twisted Sister, who was at the peak of their career also. Um, what was that tour like? What do you remember from that? What I remember from that was that um, we had played with a lot of really good bands. And then there was Twisted Sister. I mean, these guys were just monsters on stage. They were very aggressive. Um, a great band. Really nice people, of course. Um, and D really had a command of the audience that was really unique. You know, he's a great front man. So we had, um, we had stiff competition and we had to be on our toes. And it was really enjoyable because both bands complemented each other real well. And it made for a great ticket, a great night of, you know, some great hard rock. Uh, and, you know, keeping in mind that both bands were out to prove themselves at that point in time. Yeah. So really, essentially, it was, it was do or die. You know, uh, we kind of felt like, hey, if we don't kill it, our lives depend on it. You know, certainly our careers do, right? Yeah. You know, so that was sort of the the, uh, the mindset back then. But it was great. They were a great band. Um, you know, a uh, lot of energy, very clever. Um, yeah, that was a time. I'll never forget it. Yeah. Yeah, it was interesting too how how Rat continued to like uh, climb up the ladder, and that was pretty much where Twisted Sister peaked at that point in their career. And after that, kind of like you know had a downward spiral. Well, I you know I I I'm not sure exactly you know what they went through when we did have the cellar. We had songs that we'd been playing in clubs, and and um, we had been familiar with um, you know post our EP. Right. Um, then came Invasion, where we did have a lot of time to, you know, uh, you know, write songs and perform them and, you know, kind of test drive them. So we made a concerted effort to, um, to watch out for, you know, sort of a quality control thing, making sure that, you know, the next record would be something that um, would be a natural evolution where you think the band would sort of go next. And then of course there was dancing undercover. Um, so we, we kept trying to um, keep the quality control there, but change it up a little bit. So it wasn't sort of predictable, you know? Um, and, you know, it was just a, a labor of love. It was a lot of work and a big, you know, we were, highly dedicated to it. We toured a lot, worked really, really hard. Um, and, uh, you know, um, as did a lot of bands, right? Yeah. Uh, for, for that tour for 1985, you, uh, did a co-headlining tour with Bon Jovi. And, and that was, that was the first time. 85, the invasion. Yeah. Um, so interesting, you know, we were headlining and Bon Jovi was opening and both bands started about the same time on record labels and releasing their debut records. And uh, so for the invasion of your privacy tour, um, Bon Jovi was opening for Rat and they put on a great show. John was uh, a very savvy front man, uh, clever guy, great chemistry with Richie and the rest of the guys. Um, I knew that they had a bright future in front of them. 
And so that's where it lasted about six months, give or take a month or two. Um, and uh, it was a great success. You know, you can always tell when an opening band is doing well because the fans would get there early for the opening band. So by the time they came on, the place would be packed, right? You know, so it was a great tour. And then, of course, after that, they went on to do Slippery When Wet. And the rest was history, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, now, I remember um, reading rumors back then that there was going to be a Motley Crue rat tour. Was that something that was actually talked about at the time? Or was that just, like, crazy rumors? No, we actually did a few shows together. Um, but at the time, you know, both bands were, um, I, you know, dangerous in a good way, right? And uh, I think it was decided through uh, management that it would be better for us not to uh, not to tour together, <laughs> only because it might have got a little out of control. You know, those guys are great. You know, um, we go way back together. And um, so, yeah, we did have the opportunity to, to, to do some shows together, uh, but not as many as I wanted to do, that's for sure. Yeah, it seems like almost at that time, I mean, Motley Crue and, and uh, Rat, Bon Jovi were like, probably like the top three pretty much, or Bon Jovi was getting there after, after Slippery was released. I mean, that would have been, that could have been a stadium tour right there, like in 1987, those three bands. Yeah. Yeah, it could have been, and and there were a lot of um, a lot of uh, bands that you know were uh, were definitely making a name for themselves. You know, it was a very competitive time. Um, you know, we took Poison out with us, um, and they also did really really well. And we again, we could tell that they were doing really good. Um, you know, when by the time they came on, uh, the place was packed. So, you know, there was a lot of healthy competition back then. And, um, you know, um, I think a lot of, it, you know, it was sort of a different time, right, for touring. So, um, you know, a lot of bands elected to work in the arenas and, and headlining the arenas was sort of the ultimate goal at that point in time. You know, and so that's what most bands pursued. Yeah. Um, one of the things that was uh, very popular with, you know, Motley Crue and Bon Jovi and tons of other bands was the ballad. And it seems like rap really never had that big ballad. Was that something that was talked about from the record company and the record company ever, you know, try to convince you guys to, you know, write that power ballad? You know, I, I think that um, a lot of certain bands sort of have a knack for that. You know, um, it's sort of like in their, if you, for lack of better expression, DNA, you know, stylistically. And uh, we had a song called Giving Yourself Away. And there was another song that we ended up not releasing that was called Wishing Well. Um, and it was the kind of thing where um, we also have a song that's sort of a power ballad-ish called uh, Closer to My Heart. Um and so we sort of tried to stay with what felt right to us, you know, and so we just didn't um, traverse that, that sort of that direction, and, you know, and it wasn't anything other than um, we had other songs that we were focused on and, um, you know, it, it, it sometimes when you have a certain song, it, it has to feel right to everybody, you know, has to feel like the band really means it. There has to be a sense of sincerity, you know, it can't be forced. So naturally, you know, we just took our own direction and it didn't involve a whole lot of ballads, um, but um, uh, it did involve some, some fun, hard rock, uh, you know, sort of, uh, you know, songs. Yeah. When, when you guys wrote for a record, were there a lot of songs that you wrote and you had to choose the best 10 or did you pretty much just write the amount of songs that you needed for the record? No, there were a lot of leftover songs. There were a lot of songs. I would bring in many, many songs. And 
Um, it would just depend on what the objective was, what was needed. You know, uh, again, we would would make records, make videos, tour, come home, recover, make records, make videos, and tour again. Right? It was like sort of this endless cycle that we were on. So there were a lot of other song ideas, um, but there was a timeline that we needed to um, uh, sort of, you know, if you want to be on tour by summer, your record's got to be out well before that. So there's a certain, you know, timing of events that has to be coordinated. Um, and therefore, we would have song ideas that sometimes would not be developed only because we had enough material at that point in time to proceed with a record. You know, so it, you know, it just depended on the circumstances at the time. And we did work and tour really hard. So there were times that we would get home and it'd be like, hey, you know, why don't we take a breather? You know, um, so each record had its own unique, of course, its own unique set of circumstances that affected it. Uh, so, you know, we we would always deliver what we felt were um the right the right songs collectively together in a you know in on one record you know yeah and and as far as his guitar solos go how how did uh robin and warren work that out and who was going to solo on what song you know a lot of times um they would discuss which songs they they felt most comfortable soloing in and i know that the there were a couple times they asked me um, who I felt should solo on some of the songs that I brought in. And, uh, you know, I, I was always trying to be just uh, objective in the sense of what's best for the song, you know, um, because you, with Rat, you really did have two very different guitar styles. Yeah. Um, you know, Warren had that very aggressive, you know, um, very proficient, um, highly habilitated, you know, technique and Robin was, had more of a blues feel, you know, um, and they both complemented each other really, really well. That's what made the sound sort of unique, you know? And so one guitarist would approach the solo a little bit different than the other. Would. And so I, you know, we try to keep it as, as a uh, cooperative as possible. Um, and as a result, you know, um, the way it ended up, you know, Warren did m more soloing and not to take away from Robin. It was just a question of the circumstances at the time. It really wasn't premeditated, um, you know, so uh, but, you know, really, really nice um, uh, teamwork, uh, especially rhythmically between the two. Yeah, I mean, the formula was just amazing having those two. And like you said, they do have kind of contrast and styles too that really made it work. I mean, kind of like a Perry Whitford type of thing. Um, and uh, I think that's, uh, you know, was, was a big factor. I mean, at the time in the 80s, you had to have those that guitar hero and you guys had two guitar heroes, which was, was sort of unique. Yeah, and, and um, you know, it was, uh, our, you know, for lack of better... Uh, term it was our own stamp on what we felt um would be uh the the most flattering uh approach for the group you know highlighting its strengths is probably the best way to say it you know um so you know they they worked well together um a lot of times they would work um the dual guitar solos um you know you know looking at all the nuances and and examining the different options, harmony options, intervals, and things. So it, it made for a really um, uh, nice and, and um, unique uh, sort of stamp on the music itself, you know? Yeah. Now, now a, lot of, a lot of the bands I've interviewed from that era, um, you know, always had issues with being overworked, and, you know, that would lead to some tensions in the band, um, do you feel that that you were that Rat was overworked by the record label, and you put out a lot of music out and toured a lot in those six years? Do you do you, were you comfortable with that pace, or do you kind of, in retrospect, kind of think that hey, I kind of wish we would have had a little bit of a break in between once in a while? 
No, I, I feel I felt very comfortable with that pace. And if I were to say that um, there was something that maybe we could have, uh, yeah, and I don't want to say done differently, but you know, as far as allocating time, I do wish we would have spent more time on the records themselves. All right. So sometimes um, there's scheduling and there's scheduling conflicts. And um, for example, back then, uh, producers were really in demand and they would schedule their year out. They'd have three or four records they were doing within that year. And so they'd have it a lot of time to spend on record X. And um, the one thing that, you know, I wish we had done differently would have been to spend more time uh, digesting our own records. So in other words, you know, putting together a group of maybe 10 songs and listening to them for a while and deciding, okay, are there any songs that maybe we we consider replacing, you know? Um, so, but as far as the scheduling for, you know, a record label and agents booking tours and things like that, I was very comfortable with it and, and only wish that we could have done more of it. I want to talk about Reach for the Sky. On that tour, you guys went out with, uh, you brought Britney Fox with you and you also brought the band Kicks. I mean, you guys were, you guys were arena headliners at that time. I mean, what, what was that particular tour like back? So right about the time that we were doing um, Reach for the Sky, a lot of things were changing in, in the business. And, um, you know, so it was a, it was a fun tour. Um, and there was a, a, a sense of like, okay, you know, a lot of bands are doing this. There's a lot of bands you know, kind of like other bands, you know, um, but um, we just sort of stayed true to ourselves and did the best we could. And, you know, when you're in a rock band touring and making records, you obviously hope for the best, you know, but there's things that change, you know, and a great easy example of that is like when Nirvana came, you know, all of a sudden people were going, uh, hey, what happened? You know, I remember there was a tour I think it was with David Roth, Cinderella, and uh, another band opening. And they were playing in the Omni in Atlanta. And, and uh, you know, we we heard through, you know, the agents and promoters that the draw wasn't what they had expected. The draw had dropped significantly. And it was no fault of Roth or Cinderella or the other band that was under Cinderella. It was the fact that Based in music was changing. Yeah. Not when, you know, um, the Seattle thing was starting to come in, you know. So, you know, you always hope for the best. And um, the Reach Tour was, um, I think that most of us started sensing that there was something that was changing, you know. Um, MTV had sort of, you know, um, been evolving at that point. MTV was different at that point. They were starting to be a lot pickier about what videos they would play and put in rotation and, you know, what uh, what videos they didn't want, you know. Um, so, um, you know, it, it, it's always challenging for a band to stay current and stay where they, you know, at their optimum point. Um, but we did the best at the time yeah well and, and listening to this box i mean you know i don't feel like rad is one of those bands that was really influenced by what was going on at the time i mean a lot of bands did change i mean you know i mean you, you look at those bands from the 80s a lot of them almost released a grunge record you know like in the 90s and i mean sort of embarrassingly you know because that, that wasn't them and and rat kind of like sucks to the formula they sucks to their formula their entire career yeah, we, you know, th that's a really interesting um, point there. Uh, Rat didn't really look to other groups. We sort of just, you know, tried to refine what we did. Um, as an example, you know, you mentioned a, a while ago about the, the ballad thing. Uh, and we were aware that a lot of bands had ballads. And, you know, um, at one point, you know, you could sell another million records if you released a ballad you know, by the time you reach your third single, you know, and that worked. Um, but that didn't feel like what we, you know, didn't feel like it was natural to us 
in that sense. So we followed what felt right for Rat. And, you know, whatever other bands were doing, you know, we certainly noticed and we weren't, you know, oblivious to it, but we didn't want to specifically follow what somebody else, the course somebody else was taking. We wanted to follow our own path. Yeah. Yeah. The, the last record on the Atlantic years uh, was the Detonator record, um, which um, was released in 1990. Uh, was your contract with Atlantic only four or five records or did the band try to get out of the contract earlier? What, what happened with that? No, uh, we had what was uh, termed to be a, a lifetime contract with Atlantic. <laughs> You know, we sort of had unlimited options. It just sort of depended on, you know, how things went, right? You know, um, but they always had, you know, um, many options. I believe, uh, if I remember correctly, it was about 10. So that was considered a, a lifetime contract, if you will. Um, and um, we never had issues. You, look, you can always look back at anything and go, well, we, if we would have done this or we would have done that, you know, um, Atlantic was a great label and they really stood by us and they were really, uh, they really backed us and believed in us. And, uh, you know, Doug Morris and, uh, you know, Amit Erdogan and, and the staff was just absolutely terrific. And, you know, you, as an artist, you're, you're trying to evolve, you're trying to grow and that's good for everyone involved, you know? So, um, they did a great job. You know, um, Detonator was a unique record at, at a unique point in time. And obviously what followed Detonator was the grunge movement. You know, I mean, it just hit full force after that. So there were really, there was really nothing we could have done to, to sort of change that, you know. Um, so, you know, you're, you're sort of, that's kind of the, the nature of the beast, if you will, you know, things change, trends come and go, styles change, you know, your fan base changes, you know, um, you know, it, there's the old saying that, you know, um, no kid wants to like their big brother's band, right? They want to like their own bands, you know, so, oh, yeah, that's a band my, my big sister used to like, you know, so uh, a lot of rock fans would sort of, you know, personally um, you know, uh, take into uh, account or embrace, if you will, their own group of, of bands from their, that them and their friends enjoyed, you know? Yeah. And so, you know, um, no, it was a great time and, and we did the best that we could and, and it's a great record. Yeah. All right. Well, Juan, I want to thank you again for your time. It was very interesting uh, reminiscing with you about one of my favorite bands of all time. Um, everybody watching, make sure you thank purchase this. You right here it's absolutely incredible right there's yeah. the back of it yep Go it's a on. milestone it, it it really is i mean congratulations on, on that i mean that that is quite an Thank accomplishment you. it really is um yeah best of luck to you and hopefully we'll uh, see you on stage again soon absolutely tom thank you so much for your time all right you take it easy juan bye-bye okay have a great day bye-bye bye